Um, joining us now is our final keynote speaker, Virginia Sanfordello. Virginia draws, builds, 3D prints, teaches, and writes about architecture. That's really a lot of things to do about architecture. And she treats it as a cultural and therefore uh, deeply influenced by craft uh, traditions and contemporary technology. So really looking for that connection between craft and contemporary technology. She's a founding partner of Emerging Objects um, and has done some amazing work in the field of 3D printing in architecture as we are about to, wit to witness. Virginia, um, it's very early on your side. Thank you so much for joining. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Greg. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So over the last four days, um, I feel that we have really heard just about anything that you can learn about printing with cementitious materials in any kind of shape or form that you can imagine. Um, and it's actually coming to the point that uh, I'm hoping a little bit that maybe you can take our blinders off a little bit and uh, open up our eyes to the world of printable materials. Oh, thank you. Yes, we have done some 3D printing with cementitious materials, but we've also experimented with numerous other materials. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to walk you through some of those experiments today. Please do. All right. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a founder in the company Emerging Objects. And at Emerging Objects, we're attempting to use materials in the waste stream, such as sawdust and rubber tires, and plentiful and expensive, inexpensive materials such as salt, cement, sand, and mud to create sophisticated building materials for 3D printed architecture. And we've been developing these materials for 3D printing for the last 10 years. Many existing proprietary materials currently available for 3D printing are prohibitively expensive for use in large-scale printing, which is one of the things that led us to search for new material palettes. So today I'm going to take you on a journey through some of the materials that we've developed as we think about printing architecture and printing big. But I wanna start by talking about a material that most of us can find at home on our own kitchen table. Uh, coffee, for example. Of course, coffee is used to flavor water for drinking, but I think it's also essential to understand how flavoring itself and how objects for the built environment can quite literally be flavored in terms of texture, and color, and aroma by their inherent materiality. So materials such as coffee flour have the ability to be transformed through 3D printing. The production and consumption of coffee offers many opportunities to harvest waste, starting in the field where coffee beans are picked is one of the first opportunities. The coffee bean, of course, can be found at the center of the coffee tree's fruit, or the coffee cherry, as it's called. And the bean goes through the process of drying or washing as it's separated from the cherry pulp. And the bean continues on its path to become the coffee that we know, but the cherry is left to rot in the field, and it's an agricultural waste product. It often gets dumped into rivers or left in heaps. Coffee flour, however, is a new product that can be made by collecting, drying, and pulverizing those cherries into a powder. It's certainly edible, but it also has excellent 3D printing capabilities, as evidenced here in these flavorful and aromatic 3D printed coffee coffee cups. Coffee grounds are also useful for 3D printing. These grounds have been collected and recycled from my own kitchen, and they're used here to print this coffee coffee pot. Materials such as sugar can also easily be 3D printed because of sugar's inherent solubility and stickiness. It's possible to print the sweetest of confections. And in this case, the sugar spoons are printed in volumes corresponding to one teaspoon, two teaspoons, one tablespoon, and beyond. And of course, your sugar spoons can be stirred down and dissolved into your coffee to flavor it with sweetness. One can also find tea waste being generated in the field during production and post-consumption, similar to coffee and tea can be shaped into functional objects such as these teaspoons. The teaspoons are flavored with sugar and lemon and they also dissolve in hot water 
to become fragrant with a syrupy aroma of herbs. And of course there are teacups and a 3D printed teapot, no less. <laughs> Chardonnay grape skins. Um, we use pomace, which are the solid remains of grapes after pressing the fruit to make wine. Um, the pomace includes the skin, the pulp, the seeds, the stems of the fruit. Traditionally, of course, in Italy, this is used to make grappa. In the United States, we don't use that um, to make grappa. We use it as fodder to feed animals. But there's another potential use for grape skins, which of course includes 3D printing. And we've printed these goblets out of Chardonnay grape skins from close by Sonoma. This is a 3D printed Chardonnay building block, which is radial arrayed to create this ice bucket for Pierre Jouet. And an attempt to create a new color inspired us to print with curry. This 3D printed furry curry casserole dish makes for literally a mouth-watering object. We were looking for color, but what we found was aroma and the scent of this object as it's printing. And even now, maybe two years later, uh, is pervasive into any space where this object finds itself. And this curry dish is not only aromatic, but we imagine it to be a functional vessel that would also season the food, the rice or the noodles that would be placed in it for serving. And of course, it's always important to end with something sweet, cotton candy. This cotton candy jar is both made of and filled with sweet scented strawberry flavored candy. Perhaps the most frequently used material for flavoring, however, is salt. Salt can be 3D printed and formed into objects that we're familiar with, such as these functional 3D printed salt shakers. Salt always has beautiful optical properties of translucency, no matter how thinly or thickly it's printed. And it can be formed into flavorful building blocks of the future, which you can see here. The salt blocks can be shaped into forms that are otherwise impossible to make with traditional molds or casting. And we've experimented with different methods of interlocking and stacking these blocks. Because I'm located in the San Francisco Bay Area, this is a local material for me. Salt has been industrially harvested in the Bay Area for over 150 years. And at the peak of production, the Bay Area produced uh, 40,000 acres of salt and 1.3 million tons of salt annually. And this is using only the sun and the wind to farm this crop. These days, about 150,000 tons are harvested in the fall from the bay. So this is an example of the, the salt um, that's accrued, I think usually around the end of October, the beginning of November. And the company that owns the salt crystallizers in the bay has more recently given 16 and a half thousand acres of land to the government for wildlife redevelopment. And an additional 1,400 acres has been set aside for a residential development of 12,000 homes, which would accommodate around 30,000 people, which for us raised the question, does salt have the potential to be a building material for this development, should it happen? And so we imagined uh, the possibility of bringing salt and, get, and glue together to kind of make a, a salty glue, if you will. And we looked at very traditional um, forms of salt extraction and boiling. Uh, we were really inspired by these domes and baskets that were originally used to harvest the salt crystals. And we designed individual tiles using crystalline forms inspired by the salt itself. And we printed 330 salt crystal tiles, which we arrayed around an igloo form to create this enclosure, which we call the salty glue. And we feel like because of the optical properties of the salt, the interior is literally seasoned with diffuse light, if you will. 
And of course, there's an exterior that protects. And we imagine using salt to define interior spaces, such as bedrooms and bathrooms, spaces that require privacy, but would also benefit from the faint glow of dispersed light into the interior. Other agricultural materials that we've developed for additive manufacturing include sawdust. 7.1 million tons of wood waste are generated in the United States each year. And of this amount, 67% uh, is potentially recoverable. And we wanted to discover if we could recover this waste material to create a 3D printed wood material. And we have. So we've been able to use this material additively instead of subtractively. And we've developed a formula that takes advantage of fibers to give increased tensile strength. And one of my favorite things about 3D printing with sawdust is that we're able to create a kind of artificial grain in the wood, depending on the orientation of the digital model within the print bed itself. And when printed thinly enough, the wood can be translucent. And we've experimented with different species of wood. This, for example, is pine. This is maple. And this is walnut. And we've aggregated these walnut tiles together to create what we call the sawdust screen, which is an interior partition uh, that has openings in it which allow for the passage of light and air and views. We've also experimented with 3D printing rubber tires. In the United States alone, approximately 290 million scrap tires are disposed of every year. Around 80% of these tires are recycled, but we'd like to find new applications for the rest of those 60 million tires that aren't. Now, this is the largest uh, tire uh, landfill in the world. It's in the Middle East, and you can see it from outer space. So if you look down at the bottom of the image, you'll see these are buildings, and this just gives you a sense of scale. So we feel strongly that this material needs to find another uh, in-use purpose. We've partnered with a company called Lehigh Technologies that makes a uh, product that they call MRP, a micronized rubber powder that's generated through a cryogenic manufacturing process. The tires are frozen, reduced to crumb, and then ground into a fine mesh, which is typically used in roofing or asphalt pavement. And we're able to 3D print with this material. And we have slowly <laughs> been able to perfect this formula to make a more refined uh, finish and imagine the possibility of using it to create furniture, such as this rubber poof, which one could find outside, maybe at playgrounds or bus stops, and other exterior uh, materials or applications for this material, I should say. And of course, cement, which is the most ubiquitous building material in the world but it has to change for 3D printing, as we all know. And of course, one of the advantages of printing with cement is that no formwork is required. Formwork can be you know, up to 60% of the cost of construction. We've created a fiber reinforced cement polymer for 3D printing uh, using binder printing, which of course allows for file to fabrication process. Um, our 3D printed cement has structural capabilities when fiber reinforced. Our cement polymer uh, after printing has a compressive strength of around 4,700 PSI. Typical concrete is 3,000 PSI for comparison. And when printed thinly enough, it's translucent. <laughs> We've experimented with different finishes. So here, for example, we've sandblasted the 3D printed cement so you can see the layers from the additive manufacturing process. We've experimented with different techniques for you know, aggregating parts to make larger assemblies. Now, this is a, an early test where we just use binder clips to hold pieces together. Um, these are the parts that make up Andrew Cudlis's pee ball. Here you can see every part is unique and different, but it, they come together to make this beautiful, perfect object. 
And of course, one of my favorite things about 3D printing and additive manufacturing is that the digital model I use to make this small uh, study model is the same one that I can use to 3D print this larger uh, cement pavilion, which we call Bloom. Bloom is a uh, tempietto. It's about, I think, uh, 12 feet in diameter and nine feet tall. And it has this custom image of flowers mapped onto its surface. It's a project that we did with uh, Siam uh, Cement in Thailand using their iron oxide free cement, which is white. And here you can see the black and white image that we cylindrically mapped on the surface of the bloom structure. The white from that black and white image in the graphic becomes the solid area and the black is translated to openings within the surface that allow again for the transmission of light, air and views through this visual motif. The tiles are printed either one or two at a time in a traditional um, Z Corp 310 printer. So here you can see some of the deeper tiles at the bottom of this image. They're about four to five inches deep and they have holes in them for mechanical fastening. And as we move up to the top of the pavilion, the tiles become much thinner, only around one inch deep so we could print more tiles at a time, but also reduce the weight of the structure as we moved up. This slide just shows an example of how we print out the full scale um, floor plan of the building itself and lay out the blocks for assembly. And this sequence of images shows the assembly process. So we print the full scale image, lay out the blocks, and then subsequently every piece goes into place uh, perfectly. And then we take it apart and leave it in chunks so it can be assembled quickly in the future. And in this video, you can see an example of the chunks uh, of the smaller blocks that are being erected. So it literally only takes maybe three or four hours to put this uh, pavilion together now. And here it is uh, at the University of California on display. And again, you can see through that visual motif, the pattern uh, being illuminated by interior lights. And the interior is quite different. It has a, a very different reading. On the exterior, you see the pattern of the flowers. And on the interior, you start to understand the structure of the pavilion. So each block itself has a cross inside of it. And this cross transfers the loads from the top to the bottom. And it's a completely self-supporting structure. So thank you very much, uh, Virginia. I am, must say, I'm amazed. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if there's any material that we, we cannot print with. And uh, I think if I see what's happening in the chat that uh, people are, are also fascinated uh, by this. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, people and I think they want to know all the, the technical tricks behind it. Um, and, and maybe a good question to summarize it is uh, Professor Eric Slang is asking, can you put coffee in the coffee printed coffee cup? Yes, you can. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, the slide of uh, kind of the question behind it is, I guess, uh, but, uh, what kind of binder did you use that it doesn't dissolve when you put hot water in it? So that's a good question. I mean, we have kind of two, there are two ways to think about drinking coffee out of the coffee cup. And one is that, um, well, to answer his question, the binder that we use is mostly water with a little bit of alcohol, but then we post-process the pieces with a two-part epoxy. And we've used uh, an epoxy that is food safe. So you could pour coffee into your coffee coffee cup. The other idea is that we could just epoxy the exterior and then you could pour hot water in and that coffee that's been 3D printed that's in a relatively um, fragile state would dissolve and become the coffee that you drink. So 
that's how we do it. And those are two ways to possibly consume your 3D printed coffee. I was really relieved to hear that you make it actually from the, the waste material that comes with the coffee production. At the, the first instance, I thought, oh, I'm, I hope she's not taking away my coffee. But um, <laughs> um, I, another question, uh, so all these materials, do you print them on the same printer or, or a similar type of printer? Yes, most of those were printed on uh, Z Corp 310. Um, we also use uh, ProJet, um, you know, 3D Systems printers, mm -hmm. the, the ProJet, I think the 450s and the 860s. So we've used three or four different types of printers, but they're all powder-based binder oh. printers that we've modified uh, to suit our purposes. So it's, it's rather interchangeable, uh, actually. Yes. Interesting. I, I think uh, so. The, the, there are more questions in the chat. Maybe you can can join there later and, and answer some of the questions. I think people are re really curious about it. But um, what I'd also like to know is that uh, we have all this palette of printable materials, but what what use are they in uh, in the construction industry or the, the the built environment? Have you made any architecture projects with these? Yes, we have, and. Um, we've had the, the opportunity, I should say, to build a small cabin in uh, Oakland, California, which we call the Cabin of 3D Printed Curiosities. Um, this is a building that we built in response to the housing crisis in the Bay Area because there are insufficient places for people to live that are affordable the cities of San Francisco and Berkeley and Oakland have all relaxed their zoning laws and allow for uh, AUDs or uh, ancillary uh, units, dwelling units that can be occupied to be built in backyards without any um, design review. So you don't have to get a building permit. You don't have to have the building inspector come out to examine the architecture. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to employ some of the materials that we've been experimenting with. So on this cabin, on the front facade, we've clad it with planter tiles that are made out of some of the various materials that we've been experimenting with. So for example, if you look closely here, you can see these dark brown tiles that look like they're about 80% dark chocolate. And these are made out of, um, the Chardonnay grape skins from Sonoma, the very light brown tiles that are a caramel color are made out of sawdust from the Sierra Nevadas, and the light gray tiles are cement. And every once in a while we'll mix all three materials together. We use our own waste and we put it in the printer and we print that. So sometimes we get um, different colors as a product of that mixture. And these tiles hold succulents that thrive in the mild Northern California climate. And we uh, built this about two and a half years ago. So we've been watching how these materials age and weather in the climate. And you can see they're, they're changing, they're transforming, um, but they're still quite beautiful as they, they age. And on the, the east and west facades and the roof, we've 3D printed around 5,000 ceramic tiles to make up a rain screen that will protect uh, the building as well. And we used a local California clay body and paste extrusion to print these tiles, which we call the seed stitch tiles which is a technique in knitting, which looks like uh, seeds have been kind of strewn or thrown across the surface of the knitted object. And we really like the way these tiles uh, bring a kind of soft texture to the facade. And if you look closely here, you can see they have a very simple method of attachment. There's just a hook at the top which hangs on a J bead and then the tile on top uh, overlaps, which keeps it in place and prevents uplift on a windy or a rainy day. 
And on the building, the tiles create this kind of zigzag pattern and cast shadows on themselves throughout the day as the sun shifts. And you can see vines from the garden are starting to weave their way through the tiles and they build bridges between the landscape and the architecture itself. The walls and the ceiling on the interior are clad with a bioplastic panel, which we printed using uh, FDM um, printing techniques. And the, the surface quality or the texture that you see here references traditional press tin ceilings and walls from the era of the surrounding Victorian houses in this neighborhood. Traditionally, of course, press tin sheets were stamped one at a time using cast iron molds and the molds were often painted white to give the appearance of hand carved plaster. But in this case, uh, instead of having a mold and one repeated tile, we have um, complete variability. Every tile here is different. And we really love the kind of soft sheen that this material has. We've also printed the chairs and the side tables, which you can see uh, here in this photograph as well. And of course, through 3D printing, we're able to achieve the same effect of a highly intricate and sculptural surface that might have been made to resemble molded plaster or pressed tin, but it's something entirely new. And the digital nature of printing allows this uh, to be unique, uniquely patterned and uniquely shaped. And the bioplastic is opaque uh, during the day but it's uh, backlit with LED lights. And so at night it transforms the space. We were surprised to find that the bioplastic, even the opaque material is translucent when backlit. So these walls become luminous and they're color changing. They take on the color of the light behind them and create a surface that transforms chromatically and texturally to invite different activities. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm just um, amazed by the, um, well, the fact that you can actually take all these materials and, and apply them in such a beautiful building. Uh, we get a lot of compliments for you, uh, Virginia, in the, in the chat as well. Um, uh, Professor Juliette Beckering is asking uh, if you can build with the salt elements, are they structurally strong enough to, to, yeah, to make a real uh, structure, maybe something beyond the, the salty glue that you already showed? Yes, so again, the, the binder is water with a little bit of alcohol, but because we post-process them with the epoxy, they do have uh, structural capabilities, so they won't melt. <laughs> so we could build something with them, yes. That's wonderful. And this, um, the last project you showed, um, I, I'm particularly curious about the durability of all these materials. So how long has it been out in, in the open? We finished it in early, I think, February of 2018. So it's been almost three years, two and a half years. And uh, it's been a great opportunity to see how the building weathers and how it performs. And of course, um, the ceramic is fine. It'll, it'll probably be fine for 30,000 years, right? Yeah. <laughs> we were mostly curious about the, the Chardonnay and the sawdust and the cement and, um, and they're, they're changing colors. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're still fine as well, which is exciting to see. Yeah, wonderful. I'll be interested to, to, to follow how that develops over the years. Um, and, and what about uh, what you're doing now? Are you still in these kinds of projects or other materials or what are you working on? We are currently working on a project called Mud Frontiers. Um, this started, I guess, about... Um, two and a half years ago in, in 2018. Um, we did this uh, research with 3D printing clay, mud, and adobe uh, for an exhibition titled Future Ruins, which happened uh, at the Rubin Center at the University of Texas, El Paso. 
um, we had an opportunity to go with students from the university to harvest wild clays in both the United States, Texas and New Mexico, and uh, Mexico. So we dug clay in Chihuahua, in all these areas around the border um, between the United States and Mexico, and we were amazed to find all these different uh, colors of clay, and, and we thought it, the variety and the complexion of the clay at the border was so beautiful. We've also been developing our own software as part of this project. It's called Potterware. Um, it's a software that's very easy to use. It runs in the cloud, and you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that uh, users can just slide um, these dots or bars to change the geometry of uh, the G code, which is being generated for 3D printing vessels. And we did this to kind of lower the bar so that students or uh, users who had never 3D modeled anything or 3D printed anything could very easily and very quickly design something that they could make. And we've continued to improve the software. So here you can see we're experimenting with non-planar printing, giving users the ability to make multiple prints for example. And the students who dug the clays, uh, we gave them access to this software. We gave them a 3D printer and they printed 170 vessels using this uh, clay that they dug, which was amazing because these students had never, had never 3D printed anything before. They had never modeled anything in the computer before. And literally within like two or three days, they were up and running. So that for us was particularly exciting to have the ability to share uh, this knowledge and these skills uh, with a new group of users. And so here you can just see a close up of some of the, the beautiful vessels that they made. And parallel to that, um, to excavating the local clays, we were um, digging mud. <laughs> To, to make large scale Adobe prints as well. So the students worked with us on this too. And we have a new large format SCARA printer that we have designed to print building size walls and objects in the landscape. So here we are with our SCARA robotic arm or 3D printer um, printing on a mesa in El Paso overlooking Juarez. And we call this project Mud Frontiers for two reasons. One, because we're literally printing at the border, the frontier between the United States and Mexico. And two, because we're exploring technological frontiers through the lens of mud, which is a very very traditional building material in this region and most of the southwestern part of the United States. So in this image, we've taken the robotic arm inside the gallery and brought in the local clays and printed this enclosure. Uh, it's about seven feet wide and eight feet tall. And you can see the robot arm is much smaller than the object that's being printed. And here we're able to demonstrate the capability of using this material that local communities have built their homes and places of worship and work out of um, for thousands of years. And we're able to do this again. And here you can see the 3D printed Adobe structure with the, the vessels that the students made uh, in the background. And then last year, we took the robotic setup to the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado, which is where I am now. Um, and this is our fabrication setup. So if you look at the bottom of the image, you can see our wheelbarrow full of local mud that we're digging uh, on site here, using the tacit knowledge of the community. Again, this is a region, it's actually the traditional or the historic border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, houses and buildings have been made for uh, hundreds and thousands of years out of mud here. Uh, the Taos Pueblo is here. This is the longest continuously occupied building in North America. 
It's a multi-story uh, mud structure. So we're using the local mud, we're depositing it into a hopper. Um, the hopper is connected to a hose, which is held in place by the backhoe. <laughs> and then the hose is connected to the robot and you can see this uh, lacy like structure that's being 3D printed out of the mud. And last summer we printed four objects um, and we kind of experimented with them under four different themes. We called them the lookout, the hearth, the beacon, and the kiln. And what you're looking at now is the beacon, which is under construction. Uh, this structure pavilion explores how texture and undulation of the 3D printed coil of mud can produce the thinnest possible cross section for enclosure. So this is one single line of clay. The coils are then illuminated at night um, to show, I think, the contrast or the difference between the convex and concave surfaces that create the mud walls. We've 3D printed a staircase and we use uh, this layering up of the coils to create a structure that one can walk on. And we call this structure the lookout. So you see the dense network of coils and how they add together to make the structure that underlies uh, a platform and each step itself. We also imagine that this dense, thick structure could have insulative properties. We're in a very cold region of the United States. In the winter, um, the temperature drops to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit here. We use this structure as a kiln. Uh, it employs some of the techniques already discussed, uh, interlocking, to create an inner and an outer layer of structure. Uh, this is an enclosed area that draws in oxygen, it keeps heat in the fire. And we use this to fire a locally sourced clay with juniper, which burns very hot. And these are just some of the smaller objects that we fired in that 3D printed kiln. Uh, this is a local uh, micaceous clay that we've dug in the mountains surrounding this region. It has this beautiful um, shimmer to it because of the mica in it. And the fourth experiment is called the hearth. So this was an experiment where we printed an inner and an outer coil of mud and we tied the two layers together with these juniper sticks, which have kind of structural value. Uh, it allowed us to print a little bit faster. We were able to print, I think, up to 18 to 20 inches a day instead of maybe 16 or 14 inches a day. And it gives this furry texture on the exterior of the building. And this is the interior. So for us, this, this project unearths and re-examines ancient building traditions and materials, but it simultaneously uses 21st century technology, craft, coupled with local skills and tacit knowledge to create emerging new and sustainable traditions. And now in the last three weeks, we've started printing again. We are attempting to make a larger structure. What you see here are the foundations of a house, an unnamed house that is currently being fabricated. It is about eight meters long and will ultimately be around four meters high. And in this instance, you can see we've placed the robot on a rail that we've built, a plywood rail, so we can move the robot from room to room and print continuously throughout the day. And here's just an example of robot extruding the clay. Again, we're using the inner and outer coils and you can see there are three rooms. Um, I'll show you a little video that walks you through the rooms. Here are the ideas that we're making. A first room that will be a sleeping room, a second room, which will be a living room. It has a hearth and 3D printed mud benches. And then this third room has a sunken bath and will be a bathing area. So we're getting closer to creating an occupiable functional architecture and not just a pavilion. 
Um, we have exceeded the height of the robot in the fabrication actually just this past Friday. So we built a plywood box <laughs> to put the robot on so that we could print taller. And this is a photograph from uh, two days ago. So we are about two thirds of the way uh, up. So the walls are now I think about two meters high. They will ultimately be um, four meters high. Uh, at this point, we have used about 30 tons of mud to print these three uh, structures. And we've finally been able to take one of them to the full height of four meters. In 2018, on the 40th anniversary of the Smithsonian Magazine, they made 40 predictions for the future. And the first one was that sophisticated buildings of the future will be made out of mud. And it's our aim to make that prediction come true. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Virginia, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, also, this last project uh, of the series of projects really was uh, uh, quite spectacular and, and uh, it seems to make so much sense. I think, uh, I mean, local earths and muds and clays have been used really around the globe um, um you know maybe almost forever to make uh buildings uh, certainly here also in the netherlands we've been using the local local clays to, uh, to make bricks which uh, hold up most of our historic buildings um i was uh, wondering about that um the the clays do you i mean is there any kind of baking or post-processing needed to 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 be able to use them in, in a longer term no, we are we are literally just digging the ground beneath our feet, and it's a really good combination of sand and clay here. We add a chopped straw to it, barley straw and water, and we've kind of, I think, developed a mixture that's uh, similar to what you would use to make adobe. And uh, it's sun baked and it's strong. I think ultimately we'll probably put a roof over this to protect mm -hmm. it from the rain and the snow. But otherwise, it's it's quite strong. Okay. Yeah, sun baked is a is a kind of a technology that doesn't work in the Netherlands. So uh, we only have rain <laughs> rain baked, unfortunately. Um, we have a question that came in uh, from Vera Foni. Is uh, do you stabilize the earth that you're using? With a cement? No. Uh, yeah, I think a, that's just the background of the question, yeah. Yeah, no, it's just it's just mud. Okay. Well, thanks. And uh, the other thing I find very fascinating and is is um, the, w the, the way that you've been working with students and that you've kind of given them the tools to start designing and then making things themselves. So one of the things maybe was not touched upon in, in this conference so much, but I think will be a real question for the future also, is how do we bring all these new technologies to our students and how can we kind of make sure that this, all the things that we are developing and thinking of somehow find their way into, into practice. It's, uh, uh, and, and I think it's, uh, it's um, very good that you're kind of also developing tools that are you know easy to use in a certain on, yeah, say on a user level so that they can actually start to make things with this material and with this technology. Um, so um, I am um, um, yeah, really grateful for that you have been here with us and uh, that you were here uh, this morning. Uh, well, for, for you. Um, and um, then uh, I say goodbye to you, and we move on to the closing part of our uh, of our um, conference. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Bye bye.